Good morning, beloved of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let us enter in silence, linger in prayer, and depart to serve. It is a blessing to be in the Lord's house once again. Beloved of God, the First Baptist Church of South Euclid family, we welcome you on this Sunday worship. To our visitors, we are blessed and privileged to have you in our midst. Here at the First Baptist Church of South Euclid, we always begin Sunday service with prayer and meditation. Today's meditation comes by way of the classic Charles Spurgeon morning and evening. And here is the meditation for September 6th. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, we use light to make manifest. A Christian man should show light and let it shine in his life that a person could not live with him a week without knowing the gospel. His conversation should be such that all who are about him should clearly perceive who he is and whom he serves and should see the image of Jesus reflected in his daily actions. Lights are intended for guidance. We are to help those around us who are in dark. We are to hold forth to them the word of life. We are to point sinners to the Savior and the weary to a divine resting place. Men sometimes read their Bibles and fail to understand them. We should be ready, like Philip, to instruct the inquirer into the meaning of God's word the way of salvation, and the life of godliness. Lights are also used for warning. On our rocks and shores, a lighthouse is sure to be erected. Christian men and women should know that there are many false lights shown everywhere in the world, and therefore the right light is needed. The records of Satan are always abroad, tempting the ungodly to sin under the name of pleasure. They hoist the wrong light. Be it ours to put up the true light upon every dangerous rock, to point out every sin, and to tell what it leads to, that so we may be clear of the blood of all men, shining as lights in the world. Lights also have a very cheering influence, and so have Christians. A Christian ought to be a comfort with words of kind words from his lips and sympathy in his heart. He should carry sunshine wherever he goes and diffuse happiness all around him. Gracious spirit dwell with me, I myself would gracious be. And with words that help and heal, would thy life and mine reveal. And with actions bold and meek, would for Christ my Savior speak. Those are wonderful words from Charles Spurgeon's morning and evening. Let's meet the Lord this Sunday morning in prayer. Most gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this privilege of being in your house. We thank you, Father God, that you are the God of salvation. You are the God of holiness. You are the God of precious promises. You are the God who is our light in a world full of darkness. So, Father God, we pray that you would come and you would have dominion in your house today and in the hearts of your people. Uh, Son of the living God, we pray that you might come and be lifted today. For you said if you be lifted, you will draw all men unto yourself. Spirit of the living God, come and magnify yourself in us, this tabernacle where you reside. I pray, dear Lord, that from our bellies might flow rivers of living water as we hear your word and as we celebrate your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. So come, Father God, and have dominion in this holy place. We thank you for the privilege of worship, and we thank you, dear Lord, for the presence of your saints. But in all thanksgiving this morning, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For his sake, we do pray. And God's children said, Amen. Amen. There are announcements this morning for the First Baptist Church of South Euclid. To our visitors, we tell you in advance that every first Sunday we have communion. And if you desire to join in with us, you have opportunity as we give announcements to set up your uh, communion juice and crackers. Announcements for... This day, all church services are suspended next week. Two exceptions are the prayer meeting on Wednesdays at 7 a.m. and our weekly sermon taping on Wednesdays at 5.30 p.m. 
We observe social distancing and facial masks are required or provided, and all are welcome to attend. We are so grateful to see many in God's house today. Elder John McGowan and crew are at the church Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. to maintain the church's grounds, and all are welcome to lend a helping hand. We have repeated for the last month that we, the body of Christ, cannot live by fear. For 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 tells us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you pray and do your best, you can trust the Lord our God to do the rest. Sunday school classes are meeting by way of conference call and Zoom. Contact your Sunday school teacher if you're desiring to participate. And the church Zoom account is open for any Sunday school class desiring usage. Simply contact the pastor that I may give you further info. And the Sunday school quarterly books are in. We are studying the major prophet Isaiah this quarter. And you can pick up your Sunday school books here at the church Saturday between 9 and 12. Or come by Wednesday at 530 to pick up your Sunday school book. Your tithes and offerings can be mailed to the church or given online at our website, fbcse.org. Or you may come up to the church and, and uh, deliver it yourself. Once again, Saturday mornings, 9 to 12, and Wednesdays, 5.30 to 7. We thank you for your generous and cheerful giving. And as, once, as earlier stated, we hope that you prepare your communion with us as we partake of the Lord's sacred supper today. It is altar call time. It is a special time in God's house where we, the body of Christ, meet the Lord in prayer. What a gracious God we serve. What a perfect God we serve. What a God who has a passion for us we serve. And he says that we can come boldly with our prayers and petitions and that he is simply a prayer away. Here is our prayer request. We are praying for the bereaving who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 pandemic. We are still praying for the hospital employees, doctors, nurses, and staff, and we remind everyone that they have been in this battle for five months now. We pray for our first responders, police, fire, and EMS. We pray a special prayer for our first responder, Captain Lou Davis. We pray for hospice workers and patients, the VA hospital workers, the veterans and residents of our VA hospitals. We pray for our correctional facility staffs and convicts. We pray for our meatpacking plant and a very special prayer for a meatpacking plant in California that has an unbelievably high percentage of those who have contracted the COVID. We are praying for Allison Bacon, Sister Gail Cozart's sister, as she has begun her next round of chemotherapy. Pray for our federal, state, regional, and city officials for godly decisions and protocols. Pray for Dawn Smith and the health of her brother, Charles Alfred Smith, Jr. We are praying for the Jacob Blake family and uh, the residents of Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are praying for the state of Iowa, which, Iowa, which has the most virulent uh, contraction of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are praying for the Dorsey family as several family members have contracted COVID-19. Pray for Joy Bailey, her family, and especially her brother Wendell. Pray for the church and family advocates of the Cuyahoga County. Uh, pray as Christ taught us to pray at Matthew 6. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And pray for godly growth and protection for our children as school semester begins, and a very special prayer as well for our college students. Continue to pray for truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We at First Baptist Church are praying a Jabez prayer for the property at 4790 Monticello Boulevard. We ask that you pray for the Faith Walk Center and its board members, Pastor Bruce, Sister Gwen McLaurin, Medora Jones, Catherine Evans, Anthony Holman, and our consultant, Patricia Quivenin, and pray for the FBC uh, South Euclid family, and a very special prayer for Annette Grant, who is healing from major knee surgery. Let us meet the Lord this morning in prayer. Most gracious and eternal Father, what a privilege to come before you. We thank you, Father God, first of all, for being our God. 
We thank you, Father God, for your sovereign hand of protection. We thank you for the blessed privilege of coming before you with our prayers and supplications. We thank you, Father God, that you left us with a roadmap to glory. It is your holy, immutable word. And Father God, you said that heaven and earth would pass away before your word would. So we thank you, dear Lord, that you have given us your roadmap. We thank you, Father God, that you have given us an edifying, believing body, and iron sharpens iron, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. We thank you, dear Lord, for this privilege of prayer, but in all thanksgiving, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit that has come to tabernacle in our hearts and be our advocate before our Savior. Precious Father, we need you at a time like this. So much trouble in our world, uh, so much uh, uh, dissent, uh, so much anger. Uh, sin, it seems, dear Father God, to be showing itself. But we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We know, Father God, and declare that upon this rock of faith you have built your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. We declare, Father God, that nothing shall separate us from your great abiding love. Neither death, nor sorrow, nor famine, nor pestilence, nothing shall separate us from an endearing love. A love so great that you offered a lamb without spot and without blemish for our soul's salvation. A love so great that he rose on that third day morning to verify the propitiation of sin. A love so great that he rose after 40 days and said, I go to prepare a place for you. A love so great that he's coming back to receive us unto himself. And a love so great that will, it will take all of eternity to fathom the depths of your great love. Oh, we love you, Father. But we acknowledge that you first loved us. So we leave these prayers in the faithful hands of our mediator, our advocate, the author and finisher of our faith, the second Adam, uh, our potentate, uh, uh, our bishop of our souls, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his precious name we do pray. And God's children said, Amen. No service is complete without the word of God. And we are privileged here today to introduce to some and present to others Reverend Bobby Johnson. Meet him with the elevation of your hand saying, preach the word, Reverend Bobby. Preach the word. Come on, let's give God some praise in this place. Come on, let's just magnify him in this place wherever you may be on this day. Whether you're driving in your car, sitting in your bedroom, your living room, just come on, let's just lift up the name of the Lord for truly he is worthy to be praised. Amen. Truly, we thank God for this day. We thank God for each of you. Uh, we thank God for the opportunity to be able to come and to be able to share the word of the Lord. You know, I'm just so excited about what God is doing here at First Baptist. Again, I just lift up the man of God in this place, Pastor McLaurin. Uh, for truly, he's been my neighbor for a number of years, and I would say for about a year now. So we've been so joining here, and and I just thank God for for the time that we've shared and had an opportunity to fellowship and to to grow and to sit up under His tutelage. Uh, truly, I, I, again, I just want to just give God praise where praise is just due. Uh, just so many things that's going on in society, so many things that's that's happening in the world. And, you know, when, when think about the teachings that we've been receiving here at First Baptist, uh, truly the Lord has really blessed this house with skillful men of God to, to bring the word of God. Uh, and just still feasting off of the series uh, from the book of Esther. Amen. You know, and, and from the book of Esther, when you know, we got pride and we got providence. We got prejudice and we got passion. And then uh, last week, Reverend Corey came and, and he gave us normal. Then he added an AB in front of it. And we talked about being abnormal. And so in thinking about all that which has been spoken and, and that which the Lord has given to me, it's like, you know, I won't say it's a hard act to follow. You know, but just want to make sure that we stay in line and do what I like to say is that to bridge the word of God. You know, that, that we're all flowing and hearing from the Spirit of God and flowing in the same direction. 
And so, so with that, it was a bit of a struggle because sometimes we as preachers, sometimes we got things we want to say, but I always want to find myself in a place of saying those things that the Lord would have me to say. And so on this morning, I was reflecting on the word, driving to work, uh, if you will, just allow me to have this little bit getting started. And just thinking, okay, Lord, I want to make sure I got this right. I want to make sure I, I'm, I'm hearing you correctly. And, and so, of course, I pull up to the parking lot, and, and I look, and I'm like, it looks like it's going to rain. And, and so now I'm out of the car, and I've gathered all my stuff, and, and basically my hands are full. But I was able to reach in and grab my umbrella. And so as I'm walking across the parking lot, lo and behold, it begins to rain. And so as I'm about in the middle of it, I'm thinking it's just going to be just a few drops and I'm going to be all right. But before I could get to the door, a torrential rain began to pour down. Now, be it that my hands were full and, and it looked even silly because I had an umbrella in my hand. And, and so when I got to the door, there was a, a gentleman there and he said, yeah, that's not doing you any good, is it? And, and I had to chuckle and laugh within myself, because here I am thinking, I, I've got what I need, right? You know, I, I saw that I had a need, and, and yet for some strange reason was not able to access the need. And, and so with that, I just began to laugh because the Lord has a way of confirming his word. Yes. You know, when we find ourselves in a place where we, we, we know what we need, right? And, and we know how we need it, and, 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 and most of us have what we need, but for some strange reason, we get so distracted, we put our hands, our hands get so full of things, that versus using that which God has given unto us, that we find ourselves not able to use those things. And, and so I'm walking in, and now I'm wet, and I was looking in distress. So much so that the janitor went and grabbed a towel for me and said, here you go. You can go dry yourself off. I was just that wet. And, and so that leads us to the picture of the day. The picture of the day is a young man. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he was getting ready to do or what he was in the middle of doing. But as it looks as if the rain has begun to pour. I don't know if he's crying because he didn't want to go out, go back inside or if it interrupted his play. But nonetheless, this young man is sitting here and he is very much in distress. And that's going to lead us to our scripture text on this morning because we find ourselves again in situations that we don't necessarily want to be in. Trying to figure out how do we get there and, and not only how did we get there, but how can we get out? especially in those situations to which we didn't plan for. So our scripture text this morning is going to come from 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. I want to look at verses 1 through 6. 1 Samuel over in the Old Testament, chapter 30, looking at verses 1 through 6. And it reads, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Malachites had invaded the south, and Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great, they had not killed anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city there, and there it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. And when David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept, until they had no more power to weep. And David, two wives, Anoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. And now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. 
every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I mean, let's look at verse 6 again. It says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I would that you would think with us on the thought this morning, De, from distress to overcoming. Come on, come on, preacher. From distress to overcoming. Again, here we are in the month of September. And again, I'm always reflecting on what we thought the year was going to be. You know, I'm a big fantasy football player, and I'm looking forward to the football season, and I'm trying to figure out, are we in fact going to have a season? What kind of season is going to be? I know many of you are probably still looking at the basketball championship, and that was supposed to be done weeks ago, and they're just in it. There's just so much that has taken place. You know, our children have gone back to school, most of them online, and, and there are questions and concerns that we have. We find ourselves even uh, looking at what's going on in society. We, 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 we thought that we were just about toward the end of protests, and lo and behold, we have another shooting. And in the midst of the protests, we have a shooting then. Again, it's just so much going on that, that it's almost as if we're just in this place of distress. You know, I know some of you are sitting at home, and, 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 and I know we've talked about all of these outside things and, and things that, that are out of our control, you know, but Let's make it personal on this morning and think about some of the things that we're going through personally. You know, some of us, even as I hear the, the prayer list and the prayer requests, you know, many of us are still getting bad news from the doctor. Some of us are still going through uh, our own personal battles. Some of us are having our own financial struggles. Some of us are, are having even our own family issues, whether we want to talk about it or not. But if we just make it personal that, that, that many of us might find ourselves, if we're not already, in this place of distress. And, and in the midst of all of that, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Brother Chadwick Bozeman. You know, and, and not that he was, you know, a president, but, but just as a figurehead for what he shown us to the African-American community by the lives he portrayed on the screen and by the parts that he played. And to think that this young man, 43, passes from cancer, though not uncommon, but what was uncommon was the fact that he had been battling for four years quietly and in the midst of it putting out all of this work when, when many of us would have probably thrown in the towel and sat by the wayside. You know, again, and, and you go into that and you think about all of the rain we're getting in Cleveland. That's because of all of the hurricanes that's, that's happening down south. There's just so much that's just going on. And, and, and I don't want to, to, to discourage the people of God because I'm actually here to encourage the people of God. It's not so much that, that we're coming in to talk about all of this gloom and doom, but, but if we're honest again with ourselves about what's happening in our life, there are periods of distress that we have to deal with. And, and God wants to take us from distress to overcoming. Amen. He wants to take us in our current situation and, and build us up to a better situation. And so the word of the Lord is just, 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 just that on today to, to help us see what it is that God would have us to see, understand, and know that we might get from this place to the next place so that all of the things that we see that seems to continue to happen like a torrential downpour becomes just something that was in the past because now we're moving on to get to the other side. And so when we talk about distress, and, and again, we're talking about great pain. You know, I, I, I apologize. I'm getting ahead of myself. I like to define words so we can understand what we're talking about. And so we're talking about distress with great pain, anxiety, sorrow, acute physical or mental suffering, affliction, trouble. 
And, and when we think about that definition, again, if, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us can identify with one of those words. But, but that gets us back to the scripture text on today in, in terms of looking at Brother David. And, and again, we're dealing with the Samuel, First uh, Samuel. You know, Reverend Corey's pretty much already given us the preamble. We, we know exactly how we get here, that Israel wanted to be normal, so they asked for a king. And, and so in the midst of them getting a king, they get this king by the name of Saul. And, and you know Saul, Saul had his issues, you know, unlike, most like many of us, we all got our issues, but, but he had some issues. And in the midst of that, he, he walked into a place of disobedience. And it displeased God that God said, you know what, I'm going to anoint someone else. Now, again, I don't want to give you the whole life story on, on Saul and David, but, but we know that David had been anointed and appointed to be the next king of Israel. But there was simply one problem, Saul was still around. And, and so, and Saul kind of sensing that the favor of God had left him and had now fallen upon David, began to have some, some issues with Brother David. So much so that, that he had periods and times when he was honestly trying to kill that which God had appointed and anointed. And so when we get to this story, the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel, it's, it's right before David gets ready to ascend to the throne and Saul meets his final demise. It's at this place where, where David has had encounters with Saul and has spared his life at least twice. And, and yet Saul is still challenging and still running after David. That, that so got so bad, bro, preacher, that, that David found himself in the enemy's camp. It was so bad that he went to, to, to the Philistines to, to, to go hang out for a little while. And, and from there he befriends one of the kings there. And, and that king found favor with David and gave him his own place. He said, you know, I don't need to surely dwell with you. I, I can imagine what he's saying is I really don't want to hang out with all these Philistines. You know, so, so I, I appreciate you giving me a little room, giving me a little space. But, but can I take this city over there? And so he sends him to a place called Ziklag. And so he goes to Ziklag, and, and he and his men, and it's about a little army of about 700 men, and not only is it just them, but they have their, their spouses and their children. And so they're in Ziklag, and they're essentially making a living for themselves. Go back and read it, y'all. I know y'all saying he's doing a whole bunch of it. Just, just turn back a few chapters. Read all the way back up to it. And, and so for about 16 months, David is hanging out in Ziklag, doing little exploits here and there. And all the while doing those exploits, prosperity is happening in Ziklag. Things are getting good and things are getting well. But the battle had to come to an end. The Philistines had gathered and they were decided that, hey, look, we finally about to go get Brus all. And so David, because he had been hanging out with the Philistines, you know, he felt obligated. You've, you've allowed me to, to make this my abode, so I'm going to show up with you. So here you got all the princes of the Philistines. They've gathered ready, and they're getting ready to go to war, and they walk through the camp, and they look, and they see David and his 600 men. And they're like, what in the world is happening with this? And they tell Akish, now look, I, I, I know you like but David, but David can't come with us. You know, sometimes it's all right when, when people tell you you can't hang out with them. They will res respect the anointing that's upon your life. Take that as a sign of respect and move on. So, so they, they look at David and they're like, no, David, David can't come. And so a kid tells David, look, David, you know, I, I appreciate your loyalty. I appreciate your willingness to come to this fight, but you can't go to battle with us. And so David, with this news, decides to return home. So I can imagine that he and his 600 brothers were, were on the way home. And I'm pretty sure they were feeling good about themselves. Now I don't have to fight this war. I don't necessarily want to have to fight my cousin. And I necessarily want to see my, my friend from back in the day. I don't have to worry about anything like that. So we'll just go on the zigzag and just hang out for a while. But something happened when they got home. And, and that's where we pick up in our text on today. They... they arrive back home and when they get back home their home has been destroyed 
they get back home having traveled for these days, prepared for battle. I'm sure they was tired. I'm sure that they were ready to, to, to kiss their wives and to hug their children and sit back and make merry. And, and, and they get home and, and find out that the whole city has been burned to the ground. The only good news is that no one had been killed. Uh, and I'm sure they came to that summation because they didn't see any corpse or didn't see any blood. So, so they realized that, that, okay, though no one has lost their life, they're still not here. And as a man, mind might just wander when he could think about his wife and his children in the hands of some strange person. You can imagine the, the, the things that's running through their mind, that, that, that here they are, the Amalekites have come and taken our children. Ain't no telling what's taking place. And so the word of God says they got distress. I'm talking about it says that they cried until they could cry no more. I don't know about any of you if you've ever cried until you can't cry anymore. And you go to the doctor and you hear something. I, I remember when, when, when the doctor told me that I, I had cancer. I'm telling you, sometimes you'll put yourself in a situation where you can cry until you can cry no more. When, when you think about what's taking place and, and you see yourself in a situation and the pain and, and the disappointment and the agony and the, and the anguish, all of that just comes, oh, overcomes and overwhelms you to the point where, where you, you, you can't even cry. And so here we are. They're in this situation where they, they've done all that they can do. Can, can you imagine the, the discussions, the thoughts that's running through their mind, the, the disposition that they have of, of looking and seeing that everything is gone? And then the story shifts. The story shifts because it begins to talk about David, that David not only was, was he just leading them, but he was also affected as well. And lets us know that, 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 that even the pastor is not exempt. Leaders are not exempt. Amen. David was not exempt. We, we, we find ourselves in places we're going through. No one is exempt. Matter of fact, write that down and tell your neighbor you are not exempt. See, see, most of us want to think that we're exempt, that if, if I live life this way, then I would never have to deal with any pain or deal with any suffering. But, but let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, and let's look at verses 44 through 45 real quickly. Matthew 5, 45, 44 through 45 tells us very simply, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Mm, that sounds kind of strange, Jesus. And, and, and then he goes on and says that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. See, see, God is not an unjust God. You know, it's, it's not that, that, that the we, the people of God, can't go through. It's just that we have to have an understanding of what's taking place when we're going through and while we're going through. And so they're in this place where we've seen that, that David himself is not exempt. That, that, that he's having to, to go through. And so the next thing I need you to recognize is here, write this down. The only way to become an overcomer is to first recognize you're in distress. Tell somebody, recognize you're in distress. See, see, we have this thing that's called denial. We won't be honest with ourselves about what's taking place, about the feelings that we have, the emotions that we're gathering. You know, sometimes when we turn on the TV and we, we see some of the things that we're seeing, some of the, the hate and the, the injustice, it, it, it could do something to us on the inside. Even my own personal confession, I, I had to leave Facebook because I got tired of seeing some posts from some people and some ads coming through, and it was affecting me in a way I didn't want to be affected. Some people say, you ought to be bigger than that. I said, no, I just realized I didn't need Facebook. <laughs> but we have to recognize first and foremost that we are in distress. 
See, verse 6 says it. It says it plain and simple. Now, David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. So here he is. He's in this situation where he's lost his wives. He's lost his home. He's lost his possession. Everything they've lost, he's lost as well. And now, rather than coming together in the place of distress, they begin to turn on one another. And the strange part about it is that they turned on the leader, the one that had brought them blessing, the, the one that gathered them from nothing and, and made them something, and, and, and now all of a sudden they want to turn their back on David. See, let's go back and let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verses 1 and 2. It says that David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in, ooh, there's that word again, distress. Everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. So it starts out, even in the story, when he says, you know, I got to get out of here, that, that he's got all the distressed folk. He's got all the folk that say they were even in debt, discontented. He's gathered them up and become a leader through them. And by the time we get to the end of the story, we see they're living in their own city in a place of prosperity. They should have been thinking, Brother David. It should have been said, David, we had a good life with you, David. I appreciate you, David. But, but in the midst of going through, they were willing to turn their back on David. So I need you to simply write this down. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Where are you going with this, preacher? You know, you know the statement, birds of a feather flock together. But, but more importantly, what, what we're trying to get an understanding of when we're talking about becoming, moving from distress to being an overcomer or to overcoming is that we've got to recognize who we hanging around. You know, you got that, 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 that thought of stinking thinking, right? I, I like what the word of God says over in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts bad habits. You got to be careful of who you let speak into your life. You know, we're sitting around, and I know most of us can't go anywhere. You know, it's only so much Fox News one can take. There's only so much CNBS that some you can take. Only so much you can get on scene. I know you're saying, but preacher, we need the news. No, no. You got to be careful where you're getting your information from. You know, when you're gathering around the cooler at work or when you're talking to your family, not everybody has the same agenda. We, the people of God, have God's agenda. So we need to surround ourselves with like-minded folk who are not caught up in distress but are striving to become overcomers. Yeah. See, see, Proverbs says over in 1717 17, that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. See, see, you need people around you that in the midst of your going through, in the midst of your pain, that they won't leave you or abandon you. They won't be talking about you behind your back. and You're trying to figure out how everybody got your business, why, why they know what's going on with you and your husband. No, no, no. You need to surround with yourself with people who are willing to pray for you, to uplift you, to encourage you in the word of God that will tell you when you're going through that everything is going to be all right. You're, you're in distress, but God is moving you to become an overcomer. See, see, let's, 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 let's get back to the text. Let's, let's get back to, 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 to David. And, and so here they are, these, 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 these men, these, these brothers that are with him. All of a sudden, it, it, they get self-centered. All of this time, David thinking about them, leading them and guiding them, got them at the forefront of his mind. And, and all of a sudden, they get self-centered. Why you say that, preacher? He says, it says, because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his son and his daughter. But what about David and his? See, see, sometimes when we're going through, we can get so self-centered. And that's one of the problems that I believe that we're dealing with now, even in society, is that society has become self-centered. 
See, see, I, uh, can, can I just make, this is just my own personal belief. This, this is Bobby Johnson. This, this, it's not Pastor Bruce. This is not First Baptist. This is just my thought. I, I believe it's, it's an indictment against the church for what we're experiencing in this time and in this season. That in a time when we, the people of God, should be coming together as one. I'm not just talking about the local church. I'm not just talking about, about, about the city church, but I'm talking about the global church. We, we're all suffering with this pandemic. There should be a, no reason that we, the entire body of Christ, should not have one agenda, and that is that we're all seeking the face of God for a cure. Now, I know you're saying, but preacher, we're doing that. No, no, no. We're believing our thing on our corner. You're believing your thing on your corner. You're preaching this. They're preaching that. But, but, but wouldn't it be nice if we just all been able to get together? Well, 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 how do you say that, preacher? Because the racial injustices that we see help to speak to us that we're not coming together. Because see, in a time when we can come together, now this spirit has risen and is helping us to be more divided. And versus the church speaking out, speaking out against that which they see is wrong. The church, the church, not, not, not just black church, but white church, Latino church, you know, South Pacific church, wherever church may be. But the body of Christ is coming together saying, you know what, we need to do something about this. Even Paul teaches us over in 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter as he begins to talk about unity. He even talks about if there's a part of the body that's hurting, it's affecting the entire body. And there's no way that we can think that the body of Christ is in good shape when he says he's coming back for a church, a bride, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. It's an opportunity for us to come together. An opportunity for us to fall on our knees. You know what he says over in uh, Second Chronicles. He said, what, well, if my people. He didn't say if some of the people. He didn't say if a few of the people. He said, if my people, those who are called by my name. All right, all right, all right, that's enough, man. And let's, 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 let's get back to the text. Let's, let's get back to, 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 to dealing with Brother David. So, so they're all in this place in distress. And, and, and David finds some way. And that's what we want to get you on today. And that's, that's really the heart of the message as we get back into verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30. That in the midst of this where people are talking about picking up rocks and stoning him. I don't know about y'all, but if it was me, I probably would have got on the first horse and been on my way out of town. Probably would have had a few choice words. You want nobody until I showed up. You know, sometimes we get like that, right? <laughs> you 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 getting to make it personal, but 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 the word of the Lord says something happened with David in the midst of being distressed. And can you let's let's let's, let's get that visual in our mind. You come home and your house is burnt down. Your family and your loved ones are nowhere to be found. Your neighbor's mad at you. They're yelling at you because when your house caught on fire, some members caught their house on fire. And they mad now because their house burnt down. And they fussing at you talking about what you should have done. And all thing you can think of is, <laughs> am I not suffering too? A am I not going through too? Am I not having to wear a mask too? Am I not having to be careful about where I go and who I say and what I say too? Am I not suffering too? But David does this, this miraculous thing. And the scripture says, but. And I just love that word, but, because but is a game changer. It, it, it turns things around. You're, you're headed in one direction, but all of a sudden B-U-T shows up and it just, it just flips it. It says, but David strengthened himself. Yes. David strengthened himself. See, see that's, see, that's the beautiful thing. And that's just where we want to go to on this day when we're talking about from, from distress to overcoming. Because, see, people can try to find ways to overcome. 
that's one reason why some people, you know, get caught up in all kinds of, of abuse, substance abuse, child abuse. You know, I, I hate to use the, the word divorce, but, but we, 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 we find our other ways to try to cope with what's going on. We get caught up with addictions. We get caught up in, in certain habits and certain distractions that, that stop us from, from getting to where God would have us get to so that we might be an overcomer because of the distress that we're in. But the word of the Lord says that David strengthened himself. You know, sometimes we even get busy in, in church. We can try to, you know, allow church to try to overshadow what's going on in our lives and, and, and never really deal with the problem. Remember, the first thing we said is that you have to recognize that you're what? That you are in distress. But in the midst of recognizing that you are in distress and you begin to strengthen yourself, it, it's not so much what David did that made the difference. It's how he did it that made the difference. It is not so much the what, it's the, the how. In the midst of everything that he was going through and in the midst of everything he was experiencing, how could he go from this place to that place? How could he go from pain to joy? How could he go from weak to being strong? How could he go from stress to being an overcomer? And I'm glad you ask on this day, and I'm, I'm sure you're saying, well, we done read it a whole bunch of times. Good. You're just where we need to go. It says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. See, so you see that in the Lord is a powerful thing. See, see, go ahead and just write this down. To overcome, you have to go to the right source. Matter of fact, you ought to just text somebody. Put it in the chat line. Go to the right source. See, see, I call this a positional truth. It's a positional truth because it lets us know just where David is at. He was in the right position, in the right source, because he didn't strengthen himself in himself. He didn't strengthen himself at the bar. He didn't strengthen himself watching TV. He didn't strengthen himself getting caught up in all kinds of things. It says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. Yes. See, see, that preposition in the Lord is, is just a strong statement. It just lets us know that what can happen when we're in the Lord. See, I love when Paul, he comes and he writes over in Ephesians 6 and verse 10. He says, be strong in the Lord. See, 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 you want strength? Yeah, you can be, you can have strength, but, but have it in the Lord. See, even the, the, the proverbial writer came and he says, trust in the Lord. See, see, it, it's about doing it at the right source. Watch out who you're trusting in. Watch out who you're believing in. But when you put yourself with the unending source, the creator of all ends of the earth, let him be your source and do it. In the Lord. Amen. See, Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. See, again, it's not about in all of these things. It's about in the Lord. See, we're living in a time when we're looking for solutions from the world. We're looking for solutions from the government. We're looking for solutions in the wrong place. We need to be looking for solutions in the Lord. See, see, the, the only way we're going to get spiritual victory is we got to go to a spiritual source. Yeah. And unfortunately, we find ourselves looking for spiritual victory with fleshly things. And we have to remember that this fight that we're in, the weapons of our warfare are what? They are not carnal. They're mighty through God. Again, getting back to that, that concept, it's in the Lord. See, and I know some of us, we just want what we want and got to have. But even in that, the word of God says to delight yourself in the Lord. Amen. You want the desires of your heart, it says delight yourself in the Lord. We got to get back to the right source. See, see, there's so much, again, that's, that's, that's going on that's causing distress. But the only way we can truly overcome is that we have to get back in the Lord. Not just in the world, but in the Lord. Not just in stuff, but in the Lord. 
I encourage you this day. I encourage you this season. If you want to get take that step to overcoming and getting out of your situation, get back in the Lord. Amen, amen. Yes, good word. But not only that, that, that David, the scripture says that, that David found his strength in the Lord. It, there's another statement that goes along at the end of that, and that concludes the verse, and it simply says, his God. Now, I know you're saying, well, preacher, that's just two simple words. No, those are two powerful words when you really look at it. David in distress, David going through, David suffering, David having pain, David strengthens himself in the Lord, and then they throw this, 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 this precursor in there, his God. Here, write this down. To overcome, you have to be in the right relationship. To overcome, you have to be in the right relationship. See, it's not only about being at the right source, but you got to be in the right relationship. See, David had an understanding about who his God was. See, oftentimes in scriptures, we find God showing up and saying, I'm the God of your father. You know, he just didn't look to the God of his ancestors. He didn't just look to grandmama's God. He didn't listen, just listen to granddaddy's God. He didn't look to, 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 to your God. He said, you know what? He's my God. He made it personal. It lets us know that there was a level of relationship that David had an understanding about where he was at and what he was going through, that his God would be the only one that could see him through. His God, I'm sure while David was sitting there in the midst of all of the suffering, in the midst of all of that heartache, in the midst of all of that pain, he began to just begin to reflect on his life. I can see him thinking about, about having that little slingshot and having to subdue a bear and having to subdue a lion. I, I can see him thinking about, man, even that, that slingshot allowed me to beat this big old tall giant. Ain't no way in the world I should have done that, but, but I understood who my God was. That he allowed me to get through. Even to the point where, where my, my, my predecessor was trying to kill me. Unjustly. I love Saul. He even gave me his daughter to be my wife. And his son was my boy. And here he is. He's trying to take me out. Can you imagine? But in the midst of all of that, God kept me. God sustained me. God was there with me every step of the way. And I can see David saying, you know what? You know, I know God for myself. And that's the question that I ask you today. Do you know the Lord for yourself? See, not just tuning into YouTube on a Sunday morning, not just coming to church on a Sunday morning, not just, you know, as, as Reverend Corey told us last week, going on a spiritual fast from Monday to Saturday and, and just trying to come and gouge on everything we can get on a Sunday morning. No, no, no. Do you really know God for yourself? See, I love what the writer of Psalms 91 has to say. Let me turn to that real quick. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, and I just love verse 2. And verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. See, see, you got to get to that, that personal place where it's not just about a God. It's not about the God. It's not about the Lord, but he's my God. Yes, yes, he's yes. my Lord. Yes. He's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He's, he's my cattle on a thousand hills. He's mine. Yes. Come on, preacher. Yes. He's my battle axe. He's, yes. he's mine. He's my healer. He's yes. my deliverer. Yes. He's my way yes. maker. Not just a way maker, but he's my way maker. It's not just somebody else going to see me through, but my God is going to see me through. See, when you begin to get that to settle in your spirit, that distress that you're dealing with will begin to just begin to simply fade away. I know you said, but preacher, you make it sound so easy. It is such a hard. No, 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 no. It's not a hard thing. Again, you have to get back to the right source. You got to get back to the right relationship. And again, as we started it all, you have to recognize exactly where you are. Come to know God even more so in this time. And not just on the surface, but deep down within your heart. 
See, Philippians 4.19. You saying, preacher, you crawling on all these scriptures? All right, let me get Philippians 4.19. It says that my God shall supply all my needs. My God. See, 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 when you, when you get personal and you're going through, you get an understanding that no matter what I'm looking at, no matter what I'm facing, my God's got me covered. Yes, yes, yes. And that just begins to open that door. That begins to open that door, again, that of, of getting to the place of healing, getting to that place of deliverance. And so David is sitting here. He's going through. Can you again, I, I keep trying to give you that visual. He's lost everything. Everything he gained is now everything that's gone. How many of y'all ever seen Trading Places with Eddie Murphy? You remember he was the bum that had nothing, and all of a sudden he gained it all, and Dan Aykroyd was, was broke, disgusted, and busted. He lost it all just for one dollar. But can you imagine losing it all, being rock bottom? Some of you, again, you're going through, I, I don't know your testimony, but, but you know what you're dealing with. You know your testimony. You, you know the struggles that you're dealing with. You know those thoughts that you're having. You know exactly where you are. I know some of us are saying, well, I got it good. I'm not in any of that kind of situation. Keep on living. Or be a testimony for somebody else. Matter of fact, share the word with somebody else that you know that might be going through. But, but we're going to find ourselves in a time when we need to understand that where we are is not where God would have us to be. It's just a part of the process. It's just a step. It's just a phase in life. It's just a stage. This here is not the end. Though we may have to accept it as the new normal, it's not what God had planned for us. So again, it's to encourage us that we can make it, that we can go through. So again, David finds himself recognizing that he's in distress, getting to the right source, getting in the right relationship. And then he does something that's so profound. We'll make this statement and we'll make, take our seat. He begins to strengthen himself, he begins to encourage himself, thinking about who God is and what he's done. You know, again, you got 600 men with, with swords and spears and bow and arrows, all kinds of things, clubs, axes, whatever, about, about, about to get Brother David. They got rocks in their hands about to get him. And, and he looking like, you know what? God has just been too good. <laughs> God has just been too good. I, I cannot tell you all that the Lord has done for me and what he's going to do. All of a sudden, the, 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 the atmosphere began to shift. Those who were probably had rocks in their hands, they probably looking at David like, this dude ain't even scared. Says you don't have to be scared when, when you understand who God is. Yeah. That's why he said he hasn't given you a spirit to fear. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's, <laughs> you recognize who he is. And so, so I can see David feeling like, yeah, well, y'all well, got something to me, man. You mess with me. Not only got to mess with me, but you're going to have to mess with my God too. Because I know what God is about to do. Yeah. And, and so he does this thing. He, he calls to the priests. Let's sneak down to verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please. He said it's so nice. You're in distress. He still got the, the ability to say please. Please bring me the ephod. Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. Now, well, preacher, why are you going in about this whole thing about the ephod? See, you have to understand what this ephod was. See, see, I, I don't believe it was the one that was with the high priest, you know, the one, the gold vest that had the 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel, the one that the high priest that he wore when he went to go seek the face of God. I'm sure this was just a linen ephod that they had, but, but, but it was in the, David was in the mindset to seek God. In the midst of everything that he was going through, when he began to strengthen himself, he said, you know what, I think I want to pray. And that's just where we need to be on today when we find ourselves going through, when we find ourselves in a place of suffering. We have to get to that place when we can say, you know what, I think it's time to pray. And not just those, those simple prayers, not just those off-the-cuff prayers, not just those, those grandmama prayers, but those prayers that, that bring about change. The Word of God says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. 
We say it all the time. Well, little prayer, little power, no prayer, no power, much prayer, much power. David says, bring me the priestly robe. I'm about to get into the presence of God. I'm already been strengthened in the Lord, but now I'm about to go before the Lord himself. And so write this down. To overcome, spend time in the presence of the Lord. See, 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 that's when we can begin to rejoice. That's where we can begin to shout that, that I'm, I'm in his presence. I want to read one last verse over in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Over in the Old Testament, there, 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 there's a set of scripture there. And David must have really knew his word. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. As the Lord speaks to Israel, he says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God. And you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. I know you're saying, but, but preacher, that's Old Testament. No, it still applies today. But no, he was talking to the children of Israel. It still applies to you. Don't you think if that if you seek God, just like he told Israel to seek God, that he won't show up for you? Remember, he reigns on the just as well as the unjust. He's no respect of person. Jesus, just as he died for them, he died for you. He died for all of us. And, and so he, he, he goes and he says, it, it, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. And when you're in distress, mm, there's that word again. And when you're in distress, all these things come upon you in the latter days when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is merciful, is a merciful God, he will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore to them. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying God is faithful to his word. Mm -hmm. yes. He says, look, when, when, it gets, when it gets to that place, just seek me. Fall on your knees. Come talk to me. See, see, we forget how essential prayer is. Yes. We, we forget how powerful prayer yes. is. Yes. I know I don't even know how long I've been up here speaking, and, and I don't have time to go into a whole nother series on prayer. But I just encourage you to pray and seek the face of God. Because, see, if you go back and we look at this story and we look at David and, and we see what he's going through, again, he's returning home from a fight that he didn't have to fight, a battle that the Lord took care of that he wouldn't have to go against his brothers. All that they had was lost. Even his men had turned their back on him. And in the midst of all of that, he was able to strengthen himself in the Lord, his God. He puts on the ephod, and he goes to the Lord and says, God, what you want me to do? He says, should I stay or should I go? See, that's the problem with many of us. We've come into life's choices and life's decisions that we, we say we're praying, but we haven't necessarily said, God, should I stay or should I go? See, see, sometimes we get caught up in these one-sided conversations where we go and we say, Lord, this is all we're going to do. Brrrah. Amen. Jesus' name. Bless it, Lord. And he's like, wait a minute. I didn't get a chance to say anything. See, sometimes we got to pause to hear what the Lord is going to say in response to prayer because he might just tell you to stay. And then again, he might just tell you to go. But the only way you're going to get there is you got to be able to linger there long enough to hear him speak. And so David is there and the Lord says, go. You're going to get back everything. You know the story goes. Just come on, finish reading it over in the rest of that chapter uh, of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. That David goes and he gets back everything. The story, even, I can almost preach a part two, that, that they got tired along the way. 600 of them got tired along the way, and he left 200 behind. So he goes and fights a whole army with 400 men, did not lose a soul, and gained everything back and some. Somebody say blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Lost everything he had and got back everything and some. He got back so much that he was even able to share it with some of his friends over in Israel. Here, I got so much stuff. I'm going to give a little bit to you, give a little bit to you. You see him going from distress yes, yes. to overcoming. Yes. And I think about even what God has done even in my life as I bring this all to a close. 
and all of this time standing and preaching and teaching and, and, and I know I mentioned about the, the, the cancer earlier, even when I think about uh, Brother Chadwick Bozeman, when I think about how God has preserved my own family. You know, not only have I had to have a fight with cancer, but my siblings have had fights with cancer and, and we can all stand and, and testify of God's healing power. That we can all come and say we're not surviving, but we are in fact survivors. That, that how God can do one for one and then do something else for someone else. It, it's, it's encouraging to know that I am an overcomer. We're talking about COVID-19, and I know I'm preaching and teaching strong about y'all don't move until God says so and trust the process. And, and, and lo and behold, went to a wedding to take pictures and, and, and got COVID. I can remember that first night, and this is where this message was birth when the Lord began to speak to me. I was in a place of distress. Lord, I got to deal with this had the reminder that he was just. <laughs> you talk about, now stand on it. How are you gonna tell others to make it through if you yourself ain't been through? I can please to tell you, y'all know I'm, I, I must be free from COVID because I'm standing here right now. Amen. Never went to the hospital. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, really only had one bad day and I can't even call it a bad day. I can only call it about 12 hours and just watch God work a miracle. I can remember just being in anguish in my spirit. Lord, is this it? You know, having moments when I felt like I couldn't breathe and he was like, son, you're breathing. Just, just, you're talking about, Lord, I can't breathe. And he's like, but you're breathing. You know, and moments when I felt like, Lord, I can't, I can't go on. And he's like, but you're going on. We have to move from this place of distress when we understand first and foremost that I'm in distress, Lord. I understand that, that I'm going to the right source. I'm going to God the Father. I'm in right relationship. I, I belong to him. Yes. And he's given me the ability to seek his face, to fall on my knees and pray and watch him change some things. Move from distress to overcoming. If he did it for me, I know he'll do the same thing for you. Thank you. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise Amen. in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy. Worthy. Amen. What a wonderful word from Reverend Bobby. Hope you have been encouraged by this word. Hope you place this word richly in your spirit, that it bless you and get you through these times. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God tells us we are more than conquerors. God tells us he will never leave nor forsake us. You ought to be encouraged if you're in the right relationship. And if you're not and you are in distress, the gospel message is a call. It is a call of love from God to you. If you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and this day you desire to become part of the family of believers, I ask that you simply bow your head and repeat after me, Father God, you are holy. I am not. And because of that, you sent a holy Savior in your Son. I believe he died for my sins and rose for my justification. I believe he is preparing a place for me and will come back for his own. I desire to serve him as my Lord and Savior. I invite your Holy Spirit to tabernacle and to bless and to keep me as I serve your Son all the days of my life. Amen. If you have said this prayer, God has blessed you and invited you and encouraged you that you are part of the family of believers. We would love to hear from you. If this day you have desired to give your life to Christ, give us a, an email, a text, and let us know how you're doing. We have some words of encouragement. We'd like to pray for you. And we have some literature we would love to pass on to you. As we told you at the beginning of our service, every first Sunday here at the First Baptist Church of South Euclid, we practice the Lord's Sacred Communion.
Christ told us to do this in remembrance of him. It reminds us that he is coming back for his church. It reminds us not to become so enamored with this world that you're not looking for a world not made by hands, eternal in the heavens. And because of that, he tells us that as we wait, we are to judge ourselves. And if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. It is said on the night of his betrayal that Jesus took bread. He said, this is the bread my body offered to you. And he broke and they ate together. And he took wine, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And they drank together. We thank the Lord for his communion. Let us meet him in prayer. Most gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this communion. We pray that this bread be changed from a physical to spiritual nature, that we are identified with the body of believers, and that your precious atoning blood might cover us, that when the Father looks upon us, he does not see a sinful, fragile vessel, but rather he sees the blood covering of his Son, and worthy is the Lamb. Father God, uh, we ask for forgiveness of sins, of commission and omission. We ask for forgiveness of our rebellions and our ignorance. We ask, Father God, that you search our hearts. And if you find anything like sin, bring it to our spirit that we might confess. For you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you in advance, because you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Outside these walls here in Cleveland is not Jerusalem. It is where Christ, after leaving the upper room, crossed the Kidron Valley and went into the Garden of Gethsemane. But outside these walls are the streets of Cleveland. And where you are listening, outside uh, your home, are the mean streets of whatever city you live in. But take the love of God with you outside your doors. Because what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little love. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, now and forever, and God's children said,